Hello everybody and welcome back to the Let's Talk Leicester City podcast. So we've got a lot to get into today. Obviously the disappointment of the Forest game. Big game on Wednesday in the Carabao Cup and then a huge game on Saturday against Ipswich. Also going to talk a little bit about ticket pricing and um, a fan campaign that started regarding ticket prices. But before we do any of that, James, how are you doing, mate? Okay, got over the disappointment of Friday night. Uh, looking forward to Wednesday night's game now. So, yeah, doing okay. Yeah, I feel like, because normally we record these on a Sunday, I feel like we're probably going to be slightly less moany and ranty because yeah. we're recording this on a Monday afternoon. And I think yeah, totally. time, time's passed and the dust has settled. Yeah, I agree with that. Let's, let's get into Friday because I don't want to talk about it too much because I've talked about it to death on here disappointing result and like I know against um, Southampton we said game of two halves this against Forest was a game of two halves for all the wrong reasons in my opinion yeah for me um, and I saw Winks's interview I believe that the first half they played the Enzo way yeah. and the second well, half they played the Cooper way yeah the We'll get on to the Winks interview in a little bit. I don't quite like buy this narrative that it was the Enzo way. I think it was a very poor man's interpretation of Enzo, Enzo Maresca's system. But you could see that even with that, that a lot of the players looked a lot more comfortable and they were playing sort of a lot better. With with that first half, obviously the goal that we gave away to start with, it was Awful, awful defending. Uh, Buenanote, who has been brilliant this season, but trying to dribble the ball out from his own box. James Justin not clearing his lines. And Ryan Yates, it was a good finish, but like all three of their goals, it felt like it was our own doing. Or well, own undoing. Um, yeah, um, like we said last week that their speed would cause us problems, and it did. Yeah. Um, their speed time and time again causes problems on their counter-attacking. Um, I think Nuno's gotten set up really well. Uh, and the way from Forest, I thought they played well. Um, we just, our own mistakes cost us time and time again. Um, uh, and it just cost us again Friday. And, and for the fans, it was just, it got really embarrassed in the second half. I thought Forest were treating it more like a training game on the, in the second half. And we weren't really trying. Thing is, I disagree with the fact I don't think we were trying. I just thought Forrest looked a lot fitter and they were getting about the pitch a lot like uh, a lot easier than we were. I just thought 60 minutes in, the game looked gone and the players just looked dead on their feet. Uh, I was really disappointed by, by a few, few players. I thought the game, Mavadidi and Fatu would have a great game. We both were, went missing for a lot of the time. Um, I think we discussed, I think last season, whether Fatou would be Premier League ready. Based on that performance, he struggled. His first touch wasn't what I thought it was going to be. Um, mm -hmm. So I think both of them, and there were, let's be honest, I think most players weren't at their best or went missing in the second half. Yeah, the thing is with Fatou, like, and this is where I want him to start games, and we both called for him to start. And I think in terms of the starting lineup, it was very much what most fans were were hoping for. In terms of Fatou, he's a 19-year-old kid. He's going to have games like that. He's not going to smash it out of the park every week. But it was disappointing. And I think as disappointing as the performance, particularly in that second half, was, what I think made it worse was who it was against. Yeah, your, your local rivals. And, and I think that's why I said it didn't really look like they were trying. A, a local derby, you'd expect them to be really fired up for a local derby for a full 90 minutes. But in the second half, it didn't seem like that local derby anymore. And, and, and I think the heads just dropped um, yeah. when they scored. And, and, and obviously it was going to be Chris Wood, wasn't it? Yeah. The thing is, even when he was at Burnley, he scored against us every time. And he's a right handful. Even you take away his goals, his link-up play, and he's just a right handful throughout the night. And then Alanga running off in one side, Hudson Adoy the other. Um, there was issues like that they were causing all over the pitch. But 
when we went 1-0 down, I thought the response was really good to get back into the game, Vardy with the goal. And at half time, I honestly thought we were going to go on and win the game. But I don't know what was said at half time because it came out absolutely horrendously and meant like was it 46th minute, two one down through not looking after the ball again. And uh, even even once we went two one down. I don't think we completely collapsed. Once it went to 3-1 and like the fact it was a route one ball over the top, and I don't know what was going on with Wout Faze and Mads Hermanson. For me, I think I put more of that on Faze and Hermanson, but once it went 3-1, it just went, you could hear a pin drop and it like, it's like you say, from that point, it genuinely just felt like a training, training drill for Forrest. Yeah, I think when I saw the team sheet, I thought that's a really attacking team, and, and and I just thought the way Forest play, I was I thought Skip might play to hold that midfield anchor, mm. give us a bit more. And I thought in the first half, I thought everyone's doing okay, it should be okay. And in the second half, that gap that I saw in the midfield was getting bigger and bigger. And like you say, as it got to three one, they were just mm. playing the ball around like it was a training game. And it's... I think I think the disappointment me, and you got one shot on target when you're at home is appalling. Yeah, the thing is, Forrest, and I say this through gritted teeth, and as I've said a couple of times, they're a good team. They like they're eighth in the league, seventh in the league. I don't even know. Yeah. Like it was always going to be a difficult game, but I just it's that second half that just like it's why can't we seem to have a ninety minute performance? It's like so far this season we've only ever performed well for forty five minutes, and it like. That second half was just embarrassing. And I think what, as I say, it makes it worse that it was Forest and like obviously local rivals. Also, all you could hear, and I don't know, um, obviously you sitting near the front of the cop, but all I could hear the whole of that second half was their fans singing Steve Cooper's name and like Steve Cooper will be taking you down. I think that really sort of rubs salt into the wound. Yeah, I had that throughout the game. Um but it, it was, well, we were, it was so quiet in the second half. Like I say, you could hear a pin drop. Everyone was really annoyed, upset. It's a local derby. You expect them to give their all for, for a local derby. It didn't happen. And, and and let's be honest, Forest are a good team. Nuno's got them playing really well, as we said a few weeks ago. And this was, out of the three games, we knew this was going to be the toughest one. Um, I didn't expect us to lose in the way we did, though. It, that's the big word that you say there. It's like... There's ways to lose football games. For me, that's that's what frustrates me because three one it could have been four five, even six one because that second half the amount of chances they had. There's ways to lose games, and it's like you never want to lose to your local rivals, but if you do, you go down swinging. But yeah, and if if you if your if your players all eleven give a hundred percent throughout the whole game and you get outplayed because you're not as good as the opposition and you lose one or two nil, you go, you know what, they were better than us. We tried our hardest, but we just weren't good enough on the day. Whereas Friday was we were just so below par, you look at it and go, I hate losing that way. It's like we didn't turn up in that second half. You might as well just said, Don't go back out there because we're not gonna win. Yeah. After the game, you've alluded to it earlier, the Harry Winks interview, um, basically saying that the first goal and the first half where we were performing well, uh, paraphrasing here slightly, was based on what was done last season under Enzo Maresca. He's not the first player to come out and say how much, and this is since Steve Cooper's been here, about how much they enjoy playing Enzo Maresca's style of football and how much they thought, think it suits their strengths. It's concerning to me the amount of players that are starting to come out with these kind of things. Yeah, and I think I think we said a few weeks ago, a few weeks ago, we've only done one podcast. <laughs> the last one we did, uh, when we spoke around, when you do recruitment, you want to try and get someone that uses the same philosophy and they've gone to the cheap option and got someone completely different. Now, you can't, you can't expect the whole team to, to kind of unpick everything they did last season. And I think that's the problem. They played well last season. They believed in that system and it works well. So they want to, as, as, as a 
collective do it again. But obviously you've got Steve Cooper coming in who doesn't play that way. He plays a completely different style of football. And I think the players are really struggling to buy into what he wants them to do. So remember, um, I think it was Neil that said it to me. And it's like, you could tell that a lot of it was muscle memory from last year because players like Ndidi was ma- were making that run um, into the pockets that they were making, that he was making a lot last year. And players like Buenanote, who's been brilliant and like since he's joined us, it didn't quite look as natural. But the, f- uh, the thing that I, as I've said many times, I want to give, I want to see where we are after 10 games. And that will be after the Ipswich game in terms of 10 Premier League games. The thing that I think with Steve Cooper is he got the job because A, no one else wanted it. And B, I think it was the only Premier League job he would get. I also think he got it with one eye looking on the championship because there was the expected points deduction, which is why I don't think any other manager came came in. But we've gone in a complete, we've done a complete 180 from the style of football last season to where we are now. And I think you've got to adapt to a certain extent in the Premier League, because if you look at examples like Southampton, Burnley, who just didn't adapt at all, like that, obviously, well, the proof's there, but you have got to be somewhat adaptable. But we have gone completely the other way. Yeah, and like I said, I think you need a manager in there that kind of does the philosophy the same. If you're going to do a complete change in philosophy, doing it in the Premier League is not the place to do it in your first year (laughs) because teams will take you apart while you're trying to learn things. And and I just think it it was the wrong option. Um, and, And like you say, we've seen from various players coming out with... We love the way we used to play. We're not doing that anymore. I think he's starting to lose the dressing room, if I'm being honest. I, I don't want to agree with you because I'm re- like I would love nothing more than Steve Cooper to be here next year and uh, us to have had a really successful season and him to have been the right man. But the more and more of like these little clips and interview snippets you're hearing from players, and when it's like Harry Winks as well, where he's one of your senior players, one of your um, main men. It I don't know. It just doesn't seem doesn't seem great. But at the same time, like on the flip side, we're fourteenth in the league. We're in the last sixteen of the Carabao Cup. In terms of numbers and where we are in the cups, that's like in that sense, it's a pretty good start to the season. Yeah, exactly. And, and and at the end of the day, it's a, it's a results business. You can't you can't judge a manager on one game. Same with the player, which is which is why they'll look at that bigger picture and say, I think they'll say, okay, then where they must have some kind of target for December. So where did we think we would be in December, and where is he against that target? Um, I don't think we'll see any kind of a reaction until December, Christmas time, and go, okay, then where do we need to be? Are we there where we need to be? And if they are where they need to be, then it will stay where he is. Um, the the only way that they can change that is if the players do what do what's happened in the past and kind of complain to top um and Susan about it. Yeah, the the thing that I do worry about though is you know, under Brendan Rogers, like it was left and left and left until the damage was far too much to be like, we could have had Pep Guardiola or Jurgen Klopp coming in. They weren't keeping us up at the point that Brendan Rodgers got got sacked because the rut had set in far too much. That's the only worry I have is if he he isn't to be the man that's going to take us forward, then, then don't let it drag out. No, which is why I think um, the decision point to Christmas if you get some, if he's not doing what you want him to do, and Christmas is your time, you get somebody else in that gives you a fighting chance to stay up. Whereas mm-hmm. Brendan Rodgers' season, a few games left in the season, they changed him, and, and like I say, no one was ever going to keep us up. Yeah, the, th- the thing is with Steve Cooper, he could well turn out to be the right man. I'm just not convinced by it. I'm, I feel like he's one of those. And we talk about the difference between the Championship and the Premier League in terms of playing quality. I also think that's very true for the difference in manager quality. I think he's one of those that's a very good Championship manager, 
I'm still to be convinced that he's a Premier League level manager. Yeah, I know what you mean. A lot of his substitutes, I, I, I think, are all like for like. You don't see somebody coming on that's going to change a game or, or let's change the formation around. There just seem to be a lot of them like for like people. To be fair, he has, I, I slightly disagree with that because you look at the Southampton game, completely changed the shape. Fatu off the bench changed the game. Um, and we changed, obviously, we went to the back three. Against Everton as well, Mavadidi. Like, uh, not Mavadidi, who came on not against Everton when we were losing, and it, it seemed to uh really change the game and like in a positive way. So, I don't know, I feel like that's slightly harsh on Steve Cooper. I see the point that you're making, but I also think that I am like, harsh on him, you're right. <laughs> but I do think that there's, there's an element there that I think I just want to give him a chance, and I, I f- don't feel like He's been given enough time yet to make a fair judgment. Yeah, I think you're right. I think also if you look at it, are the players giving him that right chance? Because you've seen the interviews and what they're saying. It doesn't seem like they're... The thing that worries me, and that's the main thing, is the players don't seem to have bought into what he's trying to do. Whatever he's trying to do, they don't seem fully sold on it. No. And I don't know why that is. The, the thing is as well, you look at... Um, I don't... I'm no closer now to knowing what our style of play is than that first preseason game against Shrewsbury. Because we're not a defensive team and a defensive counter-attacking team. You look at the numbers of shots that we've conceded and the amount of opportunities, Like we're not a defensively solid counter-attacking team. We're not a possession-based team. I just like You look across the Premier League and you can look at... Everton and they'll be, you know, exactly what you're going to get from Everton. You look at pretty much, I'd say, 18 out of the 20 Premier League teams, you know exactly what you're going to get from them. From us, I just haven't got a clue. No, and, and that might well be personnel based because I think the system we played last year is kind of why we bought the players we bought. Whereas I think losing Dewsbury Hall was a big blow for the club, but we had to do it for PSR reasons to get that. Um, and why that happened. I just think we, we need the right players to play that system. And now somebody else is coming with a different system. Have we got the right players to play the system he wants, which is why we've not seen it work? I don't know. But the thing is, this is why I struggle. It's like, you know, when managers have gone before and are you, I know Brighton were in a much better position when Graham Potter left for Chelsea, but they brought in then De Zerbi, who was slightly an adaption from Graham Potter's style of football, but a lot of the fundamentals were the same. And then, I forget the new lad that they brought in, that's, again, a lot of the principles of what he does is similar to De Zerbi, but obviously he's got his own slight spin on it. But all of those the players that they've had can fit into the syst- all three of those systems because they're very similar styles of football. We've gone completely the opposite direction, which I just I don't understand. And I do, as I said earlier, I do think it's a, something about it is to do with the fact that they had one eye on the championship, expecting a points deduction. Yeah, and you tr- you're trying to you're trying to fit these players into a formation and style of play that they're not used to and to do a change like that is really really difficult to do in a quick succession it can it can take 12 to 18 months to do changes of that caliber so i just think him coming in he's kind of got a mindset that this is the way we're playing because that's the way i want us to play rather than maybe changing his style of playing going well actually what what can we do that best fits these players i put that on I don't blame that on Steve Cooper at all, though. No, nor do I. Whoever, whoever comes in is going to want to play their brand of football, their style of football. Yeah. For me, that's a recruitment issue of why was Steve Cooper brought in in the first place if huge parts of this squad were brought to play a completely different style of football. And 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 that's that's the killer question is is why. I'm being perfectly honest. Why, like like you just you just mentioned Brian, they bought in three managers in succession, which kind of use the same principles. 
so the transition was quite easy whereas we've gone from one type of manager to completely different we haven't got the players to play his system we've got players to play the old system which is why it was such a strange appointment to bring in someone that plays completely different yeah but as i've said i want to give him af- i want to see where we are after the ipswich game and then I'm hoping that the team starts to adapt to him and he starts to adapt to the team and there'll be a sort of a happy medium. Because as, as we've said, 14th in the league, last 16 of the Carabao Cup, those two are, uh, facts, I think if I'd said this to you at the start of the season, we would be very happy with that as of right now. But I also think that I and as fantastic as the Southampton win was, I do... I don't want to say I do think, but I slightly worry that it's papered over some massive cracks. Yeah, and I, I think, like you say, 10 games in, Ipswich will be that kind of how do we play against Ipswich. Went down to your local rivals, rivals last week. So you, you, your next kind of league game, you should be looking to bounce back. So I, I'd be expecting them to take it to Ipswich. And I think the mentality of the players will, will prove itself on Saturday, which I'm hoping. Um, and also Steve Cooper's worth. So we need to see what happens on Saturday. I think after that, you can start making assumptions, kind of decisions and kind of, is it going to work? Is it not going to work? Yeah. Before the uh, game on Friday, I said I wanted to talk about uh, about ticketing and um, this campaign. So I'm going to put this up on screen now. Bear with me. So this is from the Supporters Club. Uh, so last night, the fierce rivalry with Forest took a back seat as we united in the support of the, uh, the We Are FSA Stop Exploiting Loyalty campaign. Let's stand together for affordable tickets and ensure every fan can enjoy the beautiful game. So I think this is absolutely fantastic. And you're seeing lots of different clubs up and down the country uh, getting on board with the Stop Exploiting Loyalty campaign. Because... Ticket pricing is just getting worse and worse and worse. And I think that comes in hand in hand with the atmospheres in grounds becoming worse and worse. Yeah, so obviously FSA, um, they're the um, organisation for every single supporters club in the country. Last time they did this, the away ticket got capped at £30. Um, So these campaigns work well and the FA always listens to that group. I think it's really important and they're trying to do all they can to make football more affordable, um, a bit like it is in Germany. It's affordable yeah. for all, um, rather than what's currently happening in the Premier League, um, or as I like to call them, the red cartel. So obviously, it's a Liverpool Man United do a lot of the dictating in it. Um, and, and I think it, it's just disgusting, the price. And I think, I think Friday night's game, obviously, it was a sellout local derby. Um, and what were the ticket prices? 50, 55 pound. I don't know about individual ticket prices for Friday night, but what I do know is, you know, on Wednesday we go to Old Trafford. Yeah. For two tickets, £82 for, that I've had to pay for the two tickets I've got. Yeah, again, that should be capped. So it's, and it comes hand in hand with the atmospheres getting worse in grounds because I thought this was just a Leicester issue until about 18 months ago, but I started talking to a few Wolves fans. Um, a few Liverpool fans, and they they all seem to say the same thing that like they're being priced out, and when they do go to games, the atmosphere is just nowhere near as good as it used to be. Yeah, because is it, you think it's football as as a working class game, um, but people who can't afford to go in this day and age because of the prices, um, and it is ridiculous. They're basically the low support has been priced out which is why you, you kind of got the high end of the market, the sponsors, et cetera, that, that fill the grounds now because they, they're the only ones that can afford it. And, and like you say, the atmosphere is not what it used to be because your loyal supporters are not going anymore because they can't afford it. Yeah, and like, I know um, I know. obviously we experience King Power most most weeks. Like We've experienced that firsthand. It's not what it used to be in there. No, not at all. And, and if you look at the, I think someone, someone, I think it might have been FSA did a, did a piece of work around inflate. If if inflation went up in the rest of the world as it has done in football, 
Um, a loaf of bread would now cost you something like £24 or something ridiculous like that. The inflation of ticket prices is extortionate if you look at it over the last few years. The the worrying thing for it is oh, it just doesn't look like it's going to stop anytime soon. And like, whilst there's there's going to be people who like, I think we're in a very privileged position in the fact that we've both got season tickets. So for us, I don't think our season tickets are overly expensive, but it's more for the one-off tickets, I think, is where the issue is. Yeah, I've also seen some rumours, not at Leicester, about season tickets in general. But some of the bigger clubs, if somebody dies and they obviously have to give up their season ticket or somebody gives a season ticket back, that season ticket will not exist anymore. Mm-hmm. So it won't go out to a wait list. It just won't exist because the clubs are trying to reduce the size of season tickets because season tickets are not cost effective for them. The thing is, particularly your big six clubs, but I think you can put really any Premier League club in the same bracket. They would much rather have a fan there who's maybe come for a one-off game, who's going to go into a fan store, maybe buy a T-shirt, buy buy a cap or something like that from the fan store, then go into the ground, buy a pie, buy a programme, compared to someone like me and you who will probably go to the hero before the game or go to go to a local pub before the game, probably not buy anything inside the ground and probably won't buy uh, won't buy a programme. And I can't remember the last time I've been in the fan store. No, and you're right. These one-off people that will pay £50 Instead of, I think, our season tickets, it's probably about, it works out about £26 a game. So the person that pays double that goes, takes their family, buys loads of food when they're there, gets their kids' programmes and T-shirts, like you say, to rather than people. And and it kind of feels like it's getting turned into a tourist sport where they don't want the, the loyal people there. They want the people that are just going to, it's a business at the end of the day. They just want people there that are going to get the money, which is why this FSA thing is so important that we get behind this and, and ensure these clubs stop exploiting people because that's what they are doing. The thing is, like you look at you look at atmospheres across Europe, there's a like it's very telling though that our atmospheres in England, and I say England especially, because you go to Scotland, the atmospheres are much better in Scottish grounds as well. The atmospheres in England are by far the worst in, in Europe that I've experienced. Yeah, and I think if if you if you look at the Bundesliga, probably one of the best atmospheres you get in games, and you look how much their season tickets are, their price of tickets, they they're capped, and and it works really well. And like you say, you you've got the you've got your working class that football was always aimed at going to them games, uh, whereas we're outpricing them people, uh, and that's the sad thing. Yeah, and it's like. Even when I went to Portugal, I think I, when I went to watch Benfica, it was something like 15 euro, fifteen or 20 euros, which is like, for the, that's like the equivalent of Man United over here because it's like the biggest, or oh, I'm probably going to yeah. cause an argument with a couple of people watching because I know Porto claim they're the biggest, Benfica claim they're the biggest. But do you know what I mean? It's the top, yeah. top sort of level of football in Portugal for 15 to 20 euros. Like, yeah. you're that's never like going to get that in England for... It's like twelve to sixteen pounds. Yeah, watch a game of football. Um, whereas you look at the Premier League, they're all forty, fifty. You look at some of the Arsenal tickets; they're in the nineties. My cousin, who's a season, t- uh, sorry, who, he used to be a season ticket holder, but uh, uh, Anfield, he says that he cut like one-off tickets there can be upwards of ninety-five quid. Yeah, it's just ridiculous. But. Yeah, so hopefully uh, that uh, this campaign can do something about it. But let's talk about Wednesday night, mate. Carabao Cup action against Man United, last 16. I was hoping we could be the, ma- the team to sack Eric Ten Hag. Unfortunately, we're going to be facing a new manager bounce with a bounce in Old Trafford. Um, it couldn't come at the worst time for us. Um, I think Wednesday's going to be really difficult now. Van Nistelrooy is going to be in charge and he'll want that Old Trafford rocking and he'll want a show of, he want a, he'll want a performance out of all them players. So it might as well be a first team to go out there to go and prove points. 
Um, I'm not <laughs> being honest. I'm not looking forward to it. It's one of those we've seen it so many times. You know, when players haven't been performing, manager all of a sudden gets sacked, and then those big name players suddenly put a performance in. I'm yeah. half expecting that on Wednesday. Yeah, they'll all be new manager. Um, might be Van Nistelrooy. I know he's interim. See what happens. It's just one of the things that they're going to have a new lease of life, the players. So the ones that haven't been performing, the Ten Hag are going to start performing. It always, always happens with Leicester, doesn't it? They'll start performing. So it'll be an interesting game. I'm just, I wasn't looking forward to it as much as I was, um, knowing that he's not going to be there. I also I think, think um, regarding regarding Wednesday, we're going to heavily rotate because the priority is Saturday against Ipswich. As much I love the Carabao Cup or the League Cup because we've got such a like a brilliant history in the League Cup. But this year more than ever it feels like it's the lowest priority. Yeah, I think you're right. I think the priority is staying up, which is a bit of a shame because I used to love the as they were called then the Coca Cola Cup runs. Um and we, like you say, we've got a good history in it. And it's great for the fans to see you go you, as you go through the competition, you get more wins and you're closer to Wembley, and, and, and fans love that. Um, but I think, oh, this this week it'll be get everyone ready for Ipswich, and I think we'll see quite a lot of fringe players playing on Wednesday night against maybe Man United's strongest team, which is not good to hear. Yeah, but I do think United will have to rotate as well because they played on Sunday, and I believe they play on Saturday as well. So I do think they'll have to rotate. But something interesting about Van Nistelrooy, who's obviously going to be in charge on an interim basis, he was linked to the Leicester job in the summer. He re- he rejected the Burnley job. Do you reckon that was because he must have had someone in his ear saying, if Ten Hag goes, which is a real possibility, you, you could have the United gig? Yeah, I think you're right. I think... Obviously, he loves United, where he used to play football. I think he got offered the training job and assistant manager. And someone, everyone knew what it was like in the summer at United. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't it wasn't going well, and it's obviously carried on. So I think someone's probably said, look, he might not last the season. And when he goes, I'll need an interim manager and we'll make sure that it's you. Yeah, it's, it's one of those, because you don't turn down two jobs. Well, uh, it was definitely one in terms of Burnley, but I... I'm pretty sure there was another championship job that was there, and obviously there was the interest from us. Like once you've had a successful spell in management, you don't go back to being a number two unless you know something's there's a yeah. like, there's a possibility there. But I'm surprised it's happened this quickly at Man United, and I don't, don't want to talk turn this into let's talk Man United. But obviously they won the FA Cup. He signed a new deal and has been sacked by the end of October. Yeah, I know what you mean. I think I sort of say that he spent he spent something like six hundred and twenty million. Um and, and I, I think in all fairness I don't know why he's gone now. Like you say, they've been poor not been good every season he's been there. They've won the FA Cup, but I think Man United won more from it. And I, and I just thought after the West Ham game why now? Like you say, he's just signed a new contract. Did you watch the West Ham game, mate? I watched the last 10 minutes of it. The thing is, they played... I thought Man United played really well in that. They just couldn't hit a barn door. They hit, seemed to hit the crossbar, the post. Delo missed an open goal. And it's like, that, to me, wasn't on Ten Hag. But, again, I, a one-off performance isn't enough to make a mind up about him. And... I haven't watched anywhere near enough Man United to be able to give a fair opinion and also don't care enough about them to want to do so. <laughs> so I'm I'm hoping they come and pick up Steve Cooper and we get a decent payoff for that. And <laughs> and then everyone everyone's a winner. Yeah, no, in all fairness, I spoke to some of my friends and United fans and they said the last few games were not on 10 hard. The players are just not responding. And I, I think it's like it was with Brendan Rodgers. They're just not responding to him anymore. And he's lost that dressing room environment. And, and when that happens, then it's time for the manager to move on. So I think that's what's happened. 
Was that was the Ronaldo interview on Piers Morgan? Was that under Ten Hag? Yes, I think so. That was mad. That interview, wasn't it? I've never, I've never really had an interest in what's going on at Man United, but when that was on, I think we were all watching it. Yeah, and um, I've seen that David De Gea has put some stuff out today around how happy he is. Um, I thought that was to do with Rodri winning the Ballon d'Or. No, I think he put something something out about um, when Ten Hag got announced, um, which I thought was quite funny. I saw the emoji. It was like the um, it was a it was an emoji you put on his story, but I thought that was to do with Rodri winning the Ballon d'Or. But actually, now you say that, that actually that makes a lot of sense. It's obviously he, he had his problems with him. But I think Sancho will be happy as well. Yeah, to be honest, it's one of those. And as I said, I don't want to turn this into let's talk Man United, but it just seems like you know, like the England job feels like a bit of a poison chalice. I feel like Man United job is because whoever goes there, I think they've had a lot of decent managers and none of them have done anything. No, uh, I think Van Nistelrooy, the next probably five games, will need to prove himself. The next five games, they'll give it his all. Mm. If they if they come out five wins, then he'll probably get the job, which is probably what he wants. Mm. Whether he can do anything good long term, I don't know. But enough about that lot. Let's talk about us on... Obviously, we've got Wednesday, which I'm slightly dreading now. I was looking forward to it, slightly dreading now. Followed by Ipswich at Portman Road. Is it too early in the season to call something a six-pointer? No, I don't, I, don't, I don't think it is, to be honest. Um, the way they're playing, the way we've been playing, um, these are the games you have to win. They still um, haven't won a game yet, have they? No, and uh, they're scoring goals, but they're also leaking goals. Yeah. Um, well, was we it just need four to... three against Brentford, or yeah. So, so they are, and and I think there's been a few games where they've scored goals and leaked goals as well. So, so we you can score against them. I think last Friday we only had one shot on target. We have to have shots on target to score. Um, so I think it'll be a good game. Hopefully, we'll win eleven eight. <laughs> the thing is there's genuine like, when I look at Ipswich I've watched them play t- two or three times now I just seem to, like the system seems there I just think they lack quality there's a lot of that team that's still that, that team that played in League One and then stepped up to the Championship to step up from League One to the Championship is a big step up to step up from League One to the Premier League, which a lot of these players have done, I feel like that might be what what costs them. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think they're just, they're just like, and I think we said this last week. The quality of players is not what you'd probably want. Um, I think they've got a few players that could be Premier League quality, but they'll need to develop. And the thing that's really difficult to do when you're in the Premier League is is give players time to to develop because you need wins. Um, yes, they are scoring goals. Yes, the football's quite good, but they are leaking goals because obviously you have to be clinical in the Premier League. What do you yeah. think why why Saturday's going to be so important? I think we will win, but we have to put a 90-minute display in to do that. Yeah, I 100% agree. But I think we've covered everything, mate. You're not going to talk about coconut rolls, no? Jesus Christ. <laughs> I, I have nothing to say. I have absolutely <laughs> nothing to say. Okay. Let's I think that, that, then. I think, yeah, that is a good point to leave, leave the podcast. Guys, thank you so much to everyone who has been watching. If you haven't already, please do hit a like. If you're not already a subscriber, believe we are about 40 away from 5k so please do hit that button but i'll see you guys in the next one